Thanks, and good morning, everyone. Um, again, this is Forrest, and this morning we're going to be talking about um, power jobs for ERP, MRP, and PLM communication. Um, this is actually the second webcast um, in a series of four about products from Cool Orange. Uh, the webcast for uh, consumable file generation was last week. Um, that is available already at uh, our website. If you go to hagerman.com and then go to our uh, webcast on demand um, under events, you'll be able to see the video here. So this will cover uh, using power jobs for consumable file generation. You're generating PDFs, STEB files, et cetera. Um, so today's focus is going to be on communicating with other business systems using power jobs. Now, this is uh, one-way communication. Um, if you need bi-directional communication, um, ideally you would use something like PowerGate from Cool Orange. Um, that essentially allows um, incoming requests. It does a lot of other things too, but but the core of that is if you need Vault to be updated with data from another system on demand, um, you need some sort of listener to make that happen. And the PowerGate software from Cool Orange does a really good job at that. So today's focus is really going to be about pushing data to other systems from Vault, uh, which you can do in a lot of different ways uh, with Power Jobs. Um, so um, I do want to briefly cover some of the things we covered last week. Um, I don't know how many of you were here for last week's webcast, so I want to make sure we at least give an introduction to the software itself, um, who Cool Orange is, um, how it works, um, and then we'll get into the specifics of how it can help with communicating with other business systems. So just quickly, Cool Orange, um, the company, they were founded in 2009 by former Autodesk employees. They're extremely familiar with uh, the Vault environment. I believe they wrote the data standard, Vault data standard, if you've ever seen that. Um, so um, yeah, they're very, very well versed in Vault. Um, they've got a ton of experience in data management, software development. Um, they've had you know over 600 projects around the world um, over the last eight years. So um, if you've not heard of them, it, you're hearing about them today, and it was really only a matter of time, right? They're growing phenomenally, and I, the, the more I work with the software, the more I love it. It's just, it's so enabling, um, because there's, I work with people every day about uh, talking with Vault and what it can do and what it can do for them, and, um, you know, it can do a lot out of the box, but um, there are certain things people wanted to do that it just quite doesn't do or doesn't do effectively, you know, out of the box. And um, Cool Orange's products are just fantastic at extending um, the capabilities of Vault um, in really a, a pretty easy to use uh, manner. Um, and not only easy to use, but I think more importantly, um, easy to maintain, right? Because whenever you go customizing, uh, uh, an off-the-shelf solution, you've really got to be careful in in terms of what it does to your ability to upgrade, right? So in terms of the products that Cool Orange offers, they focus on three areas of, of uh, helping with Vault. Um, loading of data, either from, you know, files on disk or from another system like EPDM or Windchill, something like that. Maybe a legacy system uh, like Teamwork or um, an older Vault system. Or, or really what we're seeing a need for as often as anything is merging vaults together. Um, as, you know, acquisitions happen, you know, we've got companies that have been using vault for years at this point. And when you've got a couple different companies coming together, you want to get all of that data in the same sandbox. Um, there's no real easy way to do that. Um, while keeping all of the, the history of all of the files in both systems, right? So there's a tool Autodesk provides to enable that, but it's only available to resellers and it is not easy to use. Um, 
So Cool Orange has some uh, some products to help enable that utility to make the whole process a lot easier and a lot smoother, um, right? The the second sort of bucket the products fall into the enhance like enhancing vault workflows. That's what we're focusing on in this series of webcasts. Um, you know, automating processes, enhancing processes, um, you know, introducing things like validation, which we'll get into next week. Um, you know, the power jobs and power event software um, really provide a lot of capability in that area. And then the connect, right, where this kind of bleeds over connecting with ERP systems, you know, um, Vault to Fusion Lifecycle, Autodesk's cloud product, which we're going to see a little bit of today in one of my scenarios, um, or really the Vault to any cloud system. But the connect really involves, like I said before, that PowerGate software, where you're not just connecting one way, you're not just pushing data, right? If you're pushing data, we're going to see today, you can push data with power jobs very effectively. Um, PowerGate um, is really that, that full connection to one of these other business systems, be it on-premise or cloud, um, that allows data to be communicated back to um, the vault environment, right? So again, today and the, re the rest of this series of webcasts, we're really going to be focusing on the enhanced products, right? Um, and today is the second webcast on power jobs. Again, the first webcast focused on generating consumable versions of CAD models and drawings. Um, today, we're going to be talking about um, ERP, right? So there are a lot of things you can do with Power Jobs. Uh, Power Jobs is essentially an enhancement to the default job processor. Um, it is totally possible for you to write your own custom jobs to work with the out of the box job processor, but it is not trivial. And one of the the, the key benefits of um, Power Jobs is how easy it is to write these jobs and how easy it is to maintain them, right? Um, so in terms of requirements, though, um, the core requirements are going to be the same as the Vault job processor, right? So you're going to need a Vault workgroup or Vault professional license. This does not work with Vault Basic. Um, that's another a thing to keep in mind. Vault. Basic does not have the concept of the job queue um, or a job processor, so you must have Vault Worker or Vault Professional to use Power Jobs. Um, and you're going to need a license of that software um, in order to use uh, Power Jobs as well. So the Power Jobs license would also be required. Um, you know, in most environments, I would say you really probably only need one license, maybe two. It really depends wholly upon. Um, the uh, the workload on the processor, um, and you may or may not need a CAD license. Um, everything that we're going to be talking about today um, actually wouldn't necessarily require a CAD license. Um, the what I'll be showing today it does involve a little bit of consumable file generation um, that can be done with either Inventor Server as of 2018. To release a vault um, or TrueView in the case of a drawing. Um, so you may not need a CAD license on the, the job processor computer, um, but if you don't like the fidelity of the DWF or the PDF that comes out by using the inventor server component, which is it's an Autodesk thing, right? They just introduced it, um, I guess now technically one and a half releases ago. Um, they, um, if you don't like how it comes out using Inventor Server, you may need to put Inventor on the job processor computer. It's also important to note that um, your your job processor really should be on its own computer. Um, I'm running it on the same laptop that I'm running Inventor on and the Vault client on. Um, that can cause some issues. Um, I don't think we'll run into any issues in the in the demonstration today, but um, you know the job processor will open up Inventor in the background, for example, to speed up processing. And if I'm also working in Inventor, um, a all the resources are being used for both sessions. Um, it can confuse. Like if you want to open something directly from Vault, there are multiple processes running. It causes confusion, and so typically you want your job processor running 
um, only on and on its own dedicated system. Right, so um, how does it work and why is there a benefit here? Because it's using mostly what the job processor does out of the box, right? Well, the real key to all of this is the fact that the custom jobs can be written in PowerShell, um, which if you're not familiar with PowerShell is a scripting language built on the .NET framework. Um, it can reference .NET assemblies, um, which makes it extremely powerful. Um, especially because this includes the APIs for Vault, Inventor, and AutoCAD. So you can actually use the Inventor API, the AutoCAD API if you need to through PowerShell. Um, you can also write your own .NET uh, assemblies and reference those. We're going to see an example of this. We're going to take a short dive into code today just to show you some of the capability. Um, but um, so if you've got, you know, uh, especially when we're talking about ERP communication or PLM communication, if it's something on premise, if there's not like a, a web service or a RESTful API, you can hit to upload or, or data. Um, and instead, you're, you've got like maybe a, an API that you have to work with, you know, like a .NET assembly. Um, you can do that with PowerShell. Um, but especially when we're working with the vault side of the data, um, the real key to the power here, and again, especially when it comes to something like communicating with other business systems, is uh, something called PowerVault, which is uh, a set of, it's an extension for PowerShell um, that introduces what are called commandlets, which are, you know, PowerShell commands, we'll call them. Um, cool Orange maintains that, um, and it's absolutely free to use. You don't even have to own one of their products to use it. But what it does is it lets you much more easily communicate with the vault to get information out of it or put information in. Um, this goes, you know, in terms of like getting file relationships, getting bill of materials information, um, you know, all of that is available in, in Power Vault. Um, and the best part of that is it abstracts away API communications. Um, so that you don't have to worry about if Autodesk changes the Vault API from year to year, um, Cool Orange is going to make sure Power Vault is updated to account for those API changes, um, and their commandlets are likely not going to change unless you know something, some change in the API is going to force you know a change to the the parameters that get passed or something. But you know their goal is to keep that thing stable so that from year to year there's little to no maintenance on the scripts if you're sticking with Power Vault. Um, you don't have to stick with Power Vault. You can go straight to the Vault API in these scripts if you want to, right? So, but that's why it's so powerful and that's how it works is these PowerShell scripts that are just, I mean, I knocked one out yesterday afternoon. I, I had three scenarios for this um, webcast and I decided I wanted to show one more. Um, I knocked a whole new script out in 15 minutes. Um, to, to meet the, the needs for this first scenario. Um, so it really can be that straightforward if you know if you need it to be. Now again, these are all proofs of concept and usually you want a little a few more checks and logging stuff like that. but you know as, a, as in terms of just getting the thing working, it was like 15 minutes or so. So now we're going to get into um, the actual application side of things. Um, what, um, how power jobs can help with this. And I've got four different scenarios here for four different ways you might need to get information out of the vault or places you might need to put the data in, right? So the first scenario is um, maybe you're using uh, the item master in Vault Pro. Um, I know from my experience, not a lot of people use it. Um, it fills a very specific need. Um, but what I'm finding more and more is, is you know, if your goal is to upload data to an ERP system or to PLM, um, the goal really is to get the bomb, you know, coming out of engineering as complete as possible um, so that the data that ends up in that remote system doesn't then need to be further manipulated, at least from the engineering side. You know, if, if other people need to step on it, add information, whatever, that's fine, but you don't want to have to you don't want to automate pushing this data to the system just to then have to log into ERP or PLM and do something else, right? 
Um, and so using items in Vault Pro could be a good way to get you to that complete bomb, you know, because, you know, you can add, if we're talking about Vault Professional here now, um, and, and a bill of materials, you know, you can manipulate that bomb once it gets into Vault, right? So, you know, all of these MPA uh, files were extracted from the, the inventor model into items in Vault. Um, and then we added a couple of, of items, you know, some Loctite and some paint, because um, you can't really draw those. You know, some people use virtual components. They have their own drawbacks. Some people use just an empty model file. Um, those and, uh, as well have their own drawbacks. And so using the item master here can be a, a good way to flesh out that bomb completely. Um, now, if you're using this bill of materials, though, usually the whole idea of this is that so that you can then take this bomb and get it into another business system. Um, and the way you would do that out of the box, there's no automated way to do this in Vault Pro. So you would normally go and export items and, um, you know, you can have a configuration and say, where does the CSV file go? You got to, how does it come out? And you know, where, where does, what's it called, where does it go, et cetera, and what columns need to be there. And you can save this mapping for sure, but it's a multi-step process to make this happen. Um, and it's something that you've got to take initiative and do, right? Um, so one thing that Power Jobs can do is, you may have seen last week, um, I didn't really get into it this week, but one of the key ideas of Power Jobs is you can customize, um, your life cycles in Vault, and that goes for both um, item and file related life cycles. They're all kind of the same these days. Um, but you can see in my item release process, when I transition from work in progress or um, even from in review to released, for example, I have the ability to specify a custom job type to be run. Right, and so I created a job. This is the job I created in just a few minutes last night. Um, it's called, um, what did I call that guy? Um, let me see here. Here we go, item bomb to CSV. So this is the name of the job that I want to run every time this transition happens. And so what's gonna happen is when I transition this, file from review to released, a job is going to go onto the job queue. So we can see for this item, this job is now on the queue. Um, and the, the job to do this is actually super straightforward if we're looking at like the actual PowerShell code here. Um, essentially what it does is when the job runs, this PowerShell job, this PowerShell code, this script, you get access to the item object, which is essentially, it's a power vault uh, object that gives you very easy access to the individual properties of, of the item. Um, and then there are commands in this case to get the bill of materials of that item. So with, um, this really could be, just a single line of code if I wanted it to. Um, but essentially with one line of code, I have an array of objects that has the entire bomb of that item. And then I can, the, the easy way that I found to do this to like write out the CSV is just to use a, a .NET data table to add the properties I want in the order that I want with the column headers that I want. And then just spit that out to CSV. So we're talking about you know, really less than 20 lines of code realistically um, to get that done. And then our Power Jobs job processor, I'm going to start it back up here. It's going to see that job and it's going to run, it's going to extract the bomb and write it out to a CSV. And in this case, it's going to automatically include the item number, um, the item revision, and underscore bomb. So not only do you have the bomb for the item, but it's also got the revision associated with it too, so that there's no question about what's going on. 
And this script is designed to put it out to an output folder, just on a, like a network somewhere, for example, right? So um, here is the bomb that I just wrote out. Can open up that guy in Excel. And here's the bomb with parent part number, part number, um, row order, like this bomb sequence quantity, unit of measure, and if there were descriptions, you know, it had those two, right? Um, so just like that, the bomb is out. Um, now I've, you know, written custom add-ins in the past to do something similar, and it it takes literally days to get all that working right. <laughs> um, and the great thing about something like PowerShell is if you also wanted to send an email to somebody that said, oh, by the way, there's a new bomb in this location for you, you know, it's very straightforward to send an email from PowerShell as well. So, you know, that's the kind of thing you can expand on a job very easily to add functionality. So not only is the bomb out in a place where it needs to be imported to ERP, but somebody got an email saying they need to do it. Right. So that's the first scenario, taking item information out of um, Vault and getting it into a CSV file that can be uploaded then to ERP. Um, now the second scenario, let's say you don't want to use items. Right? Maybe you hate them. A lot of people hate them. Um, well, the way that Vault works in extracting this item data, um, the reason that it works is because um, Vault, when you check in, say, an inventor assembly from inventor, the bomb information gets uploaded to Vault as well. So when you create an item from a model in Vault, it's not manipulating that file data. Um, it's not getting the files out and querying it at that time. It's relying on the data that got uploaded when you checked it in last. Um, and so that data is in the vault, just ready to be extracted if you know how to do it. Um, and Power Vault knows how to do that, right? So um, this also, by the way, works with AutoCAD Mechanical builds of material, if you're one of the few people in the world that use those. Um, so and another very interesting thing about this is um, that bomb data gets communicated to Vault even if you're using Vault Workgroup. So even though Vault Workgroup has no concept of an item, um, the bomb data still gets extracted and put into Vault. Um, so again, this is ideal for writing data to um, output and uploading to another system or really anything that you need to do with it, right? So, um, you know, the script gets a little more complicated because especially if you want to get a completely structured bomb, you need to iterate. Um, but essentially, um, what I can do is I could, for example, take uh, this jet engine assembly here. And, you know, it's got multiple sub-assemblies. And in the inventor model, I have made sure that up and down the chain, my structured bombs look the way I want them to look. And when I check all of those into Vault, that information gets uploaded. Um, now, another really interesting thing about power jobs is you don't have to rely solely on these jobs running in, result, in, in response to a lifecycle state change. Um, if you're on the job processor computer, you can actually manually queue up any job on the system, right? So I want to take this bomb, I'm going to get a bomb to CSV for this file. I can just add that job to the stack, right? And when we run that, what we're going to see is this is not getting the CAD files out. It's not having to query the CAD files at all, right? All it's doing is getting data out of, um, out of the vault. And just like that, we have this bill of materials that is multi-level. That's got, again, parent part number and part number, the quantity and description of everything, right? Um, and again, that CSV file could be um, then uploaded to an ERP system, a PLM system, what have you, right? So those are sort of like the baby steps of getting data out. Um, and on the from the vault side, you know, we have all the information we wanted. We had we have like the part numbers, we have the, the relationships, we have the structure, we have quantities, right? And we're just spitting them out to CSV. Um, but, you know, 
at that point, someone then has to take that CSV file and then upload it to the business system. Well, we can go further with Power Jobs if we want and need to. So, for example, let's say that the the system we're using uses SQL Server, um, or like in the case of one of our other customers, they have a an integration tool that reads from a SQL Server database and then does whatever manipulation necessary to get it into their ERP system, right? Well, we can take that information, the bomb that we've already got from Vault that we know how to do, um, and we can essentially write just a pretty simple um, query using PowerShell, um, you know, to, uh, to get that data directly into a SQL Server database, right? So um, let's see here. So I have a, a, a sample database here that I created. Um, so let me get that opened up here. I'm just going to empty out this table. Uh, we'll just leave it in. We'll just leave the data in here, right? So here's the table, and right now we've got um, some bomb data in here already. But essentially, this table just keeps um, the same structure that I had before, right? The part number, parent part number, quantity description, and then the date that it was added, right? And you can include like rev information um, here too. But essentially, what I've got set up in Vault here is um, when our when our assembly let's say this is our top level assembly um, transitions so this is rev c now into released again a job gets added to the stack to um, extract that bill of materials and directly upload it to the sql server database right so we run the job and it's really not going to be any slower than the other one, other than the assembly is a little bit bigger, right? So it's just iterating through all of the, the files. If there's a, a bomb, it, it, you know, iterates through, it recursively grabs everything. And now if we see we have 90 rows. Let's just reselect that. Now we have 180 and we can see here's the bomb information that we added this morning on 424, right? So just like that into the database. Pretty straightforward. Um, so that's another way that you can get this data from Power Jobs into another business system. Um, now, there's one last example I have. Um, not a lot of software, Vault included, doesn't want you directly touching the database, right? It um, it wants you to use an API um, of some sort. Um, now, in my case, a really handy system that I have that has a really nice API to work with is Fusion Lifecycle, right? Um, so let's say in this case, we're not necessarily talking about bomb data, although we could do that. Maybe what we really need to do is we need to get um, consumable versions of our files into another system, right? So again, the example I have here is Fusion Lifecycle. Right, so I've got you know a whole bunch of parts in Fusion Lifecycle. Maybe we've added a bomb up there, um, maybe a bomb from another system, right? And so we have a bunch of part numbers, and okay, I have this part number and a description, but um, and maybe even like it's used on a bomb somewhere, but nobody has any idea what it looks like. Um, nobody knows how to make it, right? Because there's no drawing, there's no model, um, and maybe it's my task to get that data. Um, into um, into PLM, right? I've got to make the model, I've got to make the drawing, or at least I have to locate the model and the drawing, right? Um, so we'll just do this real quick. Let's say I need to make this, and I know it's uh, part number 100049, right? So I'm just going to make a new part quickly. Let me show you this whole process and just how fast it can really go, um, right? And we're going to keep this super simple. I'm just going to make a, because this is like a, a cover for something, right? And let's just say something like so. And uh, 
just to give it some, you know, interesting features. So again, the idea here is, this is what I want to do all day, every day. I just want to draw, right? Um, so this is my model, and I know it's part number 100049, right? So we'll give it that name and part number. We make our drawing. Again, I'm engaged in what I like to do every day. I hate PLM. I don't want to bother with it. Um, I just want to draw, do my engineering work. And this is ultimately what it's going to let you do. Because so I can get my model done. You know, I can get the drawing. So we're now at about maybe two minutes here. And I've almost got my drawing done. I think that's good enough for now. Um, and we'll check these guys in. And then once we're in vault, we're almost done. All we really need to do is um, make sure the right behavior is on these files, right? So here's my uh, part number 49. Um, I've got a bunch of different life cycles and behaviors in my vault. Um, for this, so I need to, I'm manually categorizing these guys. Um, in a production environment, you would probably have the rules set up um, so that you can, it would automatically categorize into the right thing, right? So this is gonna go into my Fusion Lifecycle upload lifecycle. And then now when I go and release these, When it comes to the drawing, it's going to add a job to the queue to um, generate a PDF of the drawing, generate a step file of the model, and then upload both of them to Fusion Lifecycle. Right. So let's run that. It's going to be doing the job. And then just take a quick look at the job. And the reason I wanted to really highlight this um, is because um, I found it a bit difficult with PowerShell itself to make all of the, the web service calls, especially for uploading, because um, it requires like a multi-part HTML uh, post. And I found that kind of tricky with the version of PowerShell I'm using. So I did do some of the web calls right inside PowerShell, the, the searching, right? I'm basically searching for that part number to find that record, right? Um, but then I built uh, a DLL using VB.net that does the other web service calls for me because I found it easier to do that in VB.net because I understand the language a little bit better. Um, so I've, you know, I reference that assembly um, and then I call, you know, I instantiate uh, an object um, that I can use to to make those calls, right? So this little helper object here. And so again, it's just a library that I wrote in .NET. I instantiate that object with the right information, like how to log in, et cetera. Um, and then just make a call. Like in this case, you know, add attachment and then put in the appropriate information, the name of the file, you know, where it should go, where it is, you know, the information about the part that I'm working with. Um, and ultimately what I get out of this is this file, this record now has a couple of attachments. That PDF with the revision information and the step file. So now without me ever having to touch PLM, all I did was do what I do every day in Vault, right? I just added the files and I released them. And just like that now in PLM, somebody can see the model, they could see the PDF of the drawing itself to get dimensional information, tolerancing, et cetera and I never even had to log into PLM, right? Um, so 
I hope that shows how you could use power jobs to do something as simple as just take an item bomb, like sort of automating the export of items from from Vault, which is obviously not difficult, but if you don't have to remember to do it, because it's done for you, so much the better. Um, but you could always go, you know, all the way as far as automating communication with other business systems via an API so that you never even have to touch that other system or even think about, you know, what it's doing. It just sort of happens. Right. So um, just to wrap up here, um, just to let you know some of the things that we offer, um, we do sell the software so we can sell you licenses of the software. Um, we also provide assistance with installation and configuration. Um, we can create custom jobs completely turnkey for you if you'd like. So, you, you know, we get your requirements and deliver to you a job that does what you need it to do. Um, we also can provide training and enablement to help you maintain those jobs or even maybe write jobs yourself. Um, so um, that's it for today's presentation. Um, just going to take a look at some questions now. Um, Looks like, um, can it handle tab delimited files? Um, yes, it can handle just about like any format. Um, let's see, and handling raw materials on a bomb. That's a really good question. Um, I don't know if Power Jobs itself would necessarily um, help in that regard. Um, I'll have to give some thought to that for next week's webcast, maybe, or the one after, because power events might actually help a little bit more in that. It's always a struggle dealing with raw material part numbers, right? Because let's say you've got a six foot tube and that's your raw material number, but it needs to be bent in a certain shape. Um, and that also has a part number. So, some systems want just the raw material part number. Some systems need both the, you know, the the part number of the bent piece and the raw material maybe as a line item on a bomb. Um, there are things you could potentially do with power jobs as long as there are clearly defined rules. Um, there are also potentially things you could do with power events, um, you know, that could enable um, you know, making something like an attachment or automatically create um, a, a sub item on a bomb if you're using item behavior so that, yes, here's a part number, but if there's a stock number property, you know, automatically add that item number in vault to the bomb, little things like that. So there are a lot of options. It would really depend on the specifics. Um, another question, any issues referencing these tools directly from C Sharp? Um, the, I'm not sure what you mean by referencing these tools. Um, if you're talking about like, um, power vault and maybe using PowerShell commandlets in C sharp, I'm not hundred percent sure if you can do that. I think you can, and it would behave just like any other commandlet, I think. Um, if you're talking about maybe referencing a C sharp assembly in PowerShell, absolutely no problem whatsoever. Um, I chose to write mine in VB.net. C sharp, it's actually closer to, to like native PowerShell type behavior anyway, I think. Um, the, um, yeah, and in terms of like, if you need to like add a job to the job queue from C sharp, that should not be a problem. The, the vault. API is, is a .NET API. You can use that from C Sharp, no problem. I've written uh, multiple applications uh, using the Vault API in C Sharp. Um, um, if you include cost in the I properties, will this software also do costing? Absolutely. So any of those properties that I pulled out, um, you know, that's completely up to you. So you could very easily, like in the um, in the CSV file, for example. Um, I chose to pull out description. Um, if cost is an I property and it's there, you could do that. And you could even get like kind of crazy if you wanted to, like, because Excel has an API too. 
or you could just interpret the CSV file, or you could get all of the cost properties out and say, oh, by the way, here's the bomb, here's what every individual part costs, and by the way, you could put a summary saying the total cost is X, right? Because you have access to all of this data. Um, and the, the script that I wrote to do this is actually iterating through every part to see if it also has a bomb, and you have access to every one of those properties and so there anything you might need to do to to collate information to summarize information you should be able to do that um can you use an existing license that we have for autodesk vault pro or no um yeah absolutely so um you still would need to buy a license of power jobs right but um as far as the license of vault that it needs to operate if you've got an extra one or um, then absolutely, yeah. Um, if you're using network licensing, you need to be a little careful because it may try to do a job and not have a license. And I think, I don't know if it would consume a license or exactly how the job processor eventually pulls one, but generally you would want a single user license ideally on your job processor so you know that it always has it. And also a single, single user license is cheaper than multi-user anyway. All right, uh, any more questions? We just got another couple minutes here. Give it just a second to see if any more questions come in. All right, I'm not seeing anything else come in right now. So just as a reminder, not only do we you know, offer the PowerJobs software, all of the cool orange software and services, um, but we also offer document management solutions, right? We sell Vault, we help implement Vault, um, as well as a couple of other solutions. And we also provide simulation services. Um, so if you've got any needs in that area, please, you know, contact your Hagerman account manager. Um, otherwise, uh, I think that's it. I really appreciate your time this morning. I hope it was beneficial and uh, hopefully we'll see you next week for uh, our first Power Events webcast.